Hi, Dave and Demetrios. Hi, Hassan and Marie and Gozi and Leslie. Hi, Sebastian and Victoria and William. Hi, Mario. Hi, Allison and Aka. Hi to those of you who may not be joining us live, but are joining us via recording. And hi to those of you as you hop on to our session. We're so pleased to have each and every one of you join us for OUM's admission information webinar for this season. I'm Associate Professor Nicolette McGuire, and I'm OUM's Associate Dean for Student Engagement. And I'm joining all of you from Anishinaabe territory in rural tiny Ontario, Canada. And one of the things I love about being in the OUM community is that we get to all be together in virtual classrooms, although we're in various far locations across the globe. So we're really pleased that all of you could join us for our admissions information webinar today. Um, in addition to myself, we have one of your admissions counselors who you may know um, well and love, which is um, Mr. Angelo Matabe. Um, so he and I will be providing some information to help support your successful application um, at OUM, as well as some further information about the curriculum and services that OUM offers. We also have some special guests with us today. So we have one of our student ambassadors, Wheela Lifa Lima. So you get to hear a little bit from her today. And we also have a su surprise special guest joining us a bit later on in the session. So if you'd like to know a little bit about what we'll be talking about today, we're going to give a little bit of overview of OUM and our admissions requirements. Talk Angela will be talking to you about those requirements as well as the admission process and interviews. I'll be speaking with you a little bit about OUM's curriculum. Wheela will give you a little bit of information um, as one of our student ambassadors, and we'll also have a Q&A session. So you'll see in our webinar today that there is a Q&A box, so you can feel free throughout the session to type any questions that you have in the Q&A box, and we'll do our best to get to those questions. We'll either type answers or answer those live. So I'm going to turn it over now to uh, Angelo, your admissions counselor, to talk with you a little bit about the admissions requirements at OUM. Great, thank you so much, uh, Dr. McGuire, and hello, everyone. Uh, prospective students and applicants, uh, great to see a nice crowd on hand. I'm, I'm recognizing some of the names here, so that's that's great to see. So uh, today I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, just an overview of the admissions process and uh, just talk a little bit also about uh, what makes a good application, hopefully, and, and certainly I'm here to answer any questions that you may have about the admissions. So uh, on this slide, you'll see we kind of posted our just a minimum admission requirements uh, to the university in order to be an eligible candidate for our MD program, you need to have at least a bachelor's degree completed. So that is kind of a minimum requirements to enter and apply to the university. A 3.0 GPA on a 4.0 scale. Now I know we probably have a, a good number of Australian and, and New Zealand and, and possibly Samoan students here. So um, you can ask your admissions counselor to convert that for you if you're not sure. Uh, so contact the admissions office if you want um, a, a you know more a clear response about uh, if you meet the GPA requirements or not. Um, but ultimately, we do need that 3.0 minimum uh, on a 4.0 scale. English language proficiency. So this may be required for uh, some of the candidates. Again, I would encourage you to uh, speak to the admissions office about the details, but for the most part, if you have attained a, a degree, whether it's a bachelor's, master's, or a doctorate uh, at an institution where English was the primary mode of instruction, then you already meet that uh, requirement. Um, that's pretty much I, as much as I want to cover about that uh, here, but certainly you can uh, talk to the admissions team if you have some uh, specific questions about the uh, English language proficiency requirement. So let's talk a little bit about the admissions process and how it, it all goes uh, for a prospective student. And um, to be honest with you, I think for many of you who are here, and, and I hope for all of you that uh, are going to be students here, uh, that process really begins before you even formally apply uh, to the university. Um, really, 
you need to contact uh, the admissions team. Uh, you'll hear me say that a lot today because uh, I really encourage want to encourage you to do that. We're here to answer all of your questions. Uh, there's no there's no question too little or too big. Uh, we will answer anything that you need answering. Um, there's a lot to learn about the OEM program. It is unique. Uh, it is different than a traditional medical program in some ways. So you definitely want to uh, learn all about uh, you know the, what makes the program unique uh, and different. Uh, so get your questions answered. Part of that, part of those questions that you're going to ask, uh, and I definitely would put this on my list of questions that I, to ask if I was a prospective student, understanding the workload and financial commitment. Those are probably the two biggest challenges uh, our uh, students will generally face is to make sure that they have uh, a good understanding of, uh, you know, how much, uh, you know, time commitment is needed to complete the program. And, you know, what are they gonna cost me? <laughs> Very important. Uh, and again, um, I definitely would encourage everyone to get those questions answered really before you even formally apply to the university. Uh, once you've had your questions answered, uh, you're confident that this is the right fit for you, uh, then the next uh, step would be to start the online application. Uh, we have applications uh, open throughout the year. Uh, we do have uh, two intakes for new students each year. We have a January session and a July session. Um, applications are open. You can start an application. The link is on our website. That'll take you to your uh, kind of OEM account to uh, get started. The best part is you don't have to finish it all in one sitting. You create an account. You can come back to it later. And you'll get to kind of work on submitting uh, to us your official documents. This will include your uh, official transcripts. Um, we need transcripts from every post-secondary school you've attended. So you got to track those down and get those to us. Three recommendation letters. Uh, all, at least one letter needs to be from a physician. Uh, luckily, we uh, attain those recommendation letters electronically. Uh, you provide us with your reference. Uh, we'll contact them and uh, collect the letter on your behalf uh, via email. And they'll upload those letters directly to your application. And then, of course, as part of your uh, application to medical school, we want to see an essay. Uh, we want to find out uh, why you're applying uh, to OUM, why you want to go to medical school. And it's a chance to really kind of uh, tell your story about, you know, uh, why you want to become a physician. So uh, that is also uploaded uh, to your application and an updated CV uh, or resume. Uh, those are kind of the key ingredients, uh, so to speak, to uh, get your application uh, submitted and in order. Uh, and, and keep in mind, we do have deadlines for each intake. So as I mentioned, uh, we have two intakes each year for the January session. Deadline to get all of these application documents submitted and get your application submitted is on September 1st for the January intake. And then the deadline to get everything com completed for our July sessions, uh, the deadline falls on March 1st. So it's February 9th <laughs> for those of you who are Working on your application, great. Uh, please make sure to get everything in and submit your application before March 1st. For those of you who have not started yet, um, I promise you it's not too late. Uh, all of this can be done in a short time, but uh, this is really the time uh, to get started uh, sooner rather than later if you're serious about applying for the upcoming July intake. Um, and once an application is submitted, the next step is the interview process. Uh, so what happens is that uh, for a successful candidate, they will have two interviews with OUM. The initial interview is with uh, your admissions counselor. Uh, so that is kind of what we call our screening interview. Um, you know, during that interview, we'll talk a little bit about just your background and you know why you're uh, kind of interested in uh, being an OUM student. Uh, talk about your, your work schedule. How is that going to change once you become an OUM student? Very important questions. Um, you know, and, and just check your overall understanding of the program to make sure you're ready uh, to be a student here. That first interview goes well. You uh, move forward to the second interview. The second interview is with uh, our admissions panel uh, team, uh, which it will be two members of the panel uh, who will participate on that interview. 
And uh, the best part about kind of our interview process, at least one thing, one of the best parts about our interview process is that you don't have to wait around until everyone's interview to see who's in and who's out. Uh, normally anywhere between a day to a week uh, after the panel interview, we will announce a decision uh, regarding uh, your acceptance to the program. If you are accepted to the program, uh, your admissions team will work with you to get your post acceptance documents submitted and uh, get you ready for orientation and eventually for your first day of class as an OUM student. So uh, that's pretty much it. Again, just a basic overview. Again, uh, if you have any, any questions, please uh, contact your admissions team. Uh, you should at least have one good conversation, uh, one good conversation with your admissions counselor throughout uh, the application process, if not more. Uh, so don't hesitate to reach out to us. We have regional teams uh, in Australia and in, in the U.S. And, and, and everywhere to help you along with that process. So thank you, everyone. And uh, I'll be happy to stick around and answer some of your admissions related questions later on. Thanks, Angelo. If you do have questions for Angelo or about admissions, please do go ahead and type them into the Q&A box and we'll do our best to get to those. So I wanna talk with you a little bit about OUM's curriculum, but um, I also want you to know a little bit about OUM's community before we just talk with you about kind of what our curriculum is. And we have a special guest um, here with us today um, that we're very excited to, to welcome. He wasn't on the um, the docket, so it should be a surprise um, for those of you who are attending here live tonight or attending the recording. But we actually have our uh, Dean for Australia and New Zealand joining us um, as a special guest uh, this evening slash this morning. So I just wanted to introduce you to Professor Patty Dewan, who is our Dean for Australia and New Zealand. And I have a few questions. Um, for him, just to help you kind of get to know some things about OUM. But if you also have a question for uh, Dean Duan, you can uh, place that into the Q&A box. So thank you so much for joining us, Professor Duan. How are you doing? Uh, well, having had trouble getting into the Zoom meeting, um, very well, thank you. <laughs> no worries at all. We're glad you could join us. So we have a couple of questions. Um, for you. Um, one from a student that says, I live in Australia and as an OUM student, where would I undertake my clinical rotations? Can students get rotations in their home states? Uh, yeah, the rotations are available in each of the states and in a number of locations in each of the states, in private hospitals, in public hospitals. And it just depends on the timing and the circumstance of where you're at, where you are at in the rotations of doing your core rotations, doing your elective rotations. So there's a whole mix of things that can be put together. Um, the rotations uh, include the core medicine, core surgery, and the others, um, where some of them are elective. So you may find yourself in interesting locations around the country but you might find yourself in interesting locations around the world. Amazing. Um, so what are some, in addition to that, maybe finding some yourself in some unique locations throughout the world, what are some of the unique opportunities that OUM students have that you might not see at other medical schools? Well, um, being a university that is um, based um, by registration in Samoa, um, there is the opportunity to go and do both core and elective rotations in Samoa, which is a fabulous opportunity because of the clinical material that you'll see. And you'll get to learn how to use your hands and your heads and, so to speak, the knife and fork rather than the resort to fancy machines that go ping that don't necessarily have you thinking about your patients nearly as much. So it's an opportunity to connect to real medicine but with the backstop of getting mentorship from Australia so that you learn from the patients, but you also learn about the Australian context. Uh, some of the other locations um, with the international outreach work that I've been doing for a long time now, I've got connections to a number of countries around the world and there are other ways to connecting to even further countries. So for instance, you could do a rotation in pediatrics into the Red Cross Children's Hospital in South Africa, 
or if you wanted to go to the Balkans, we could organize for places like Albania and Kosovo to go and do subspecialty training, as has one of the students from New Zealand came on an outreach to uh, Pristina, which is the capital of Kosovo recently, and saw a large amount of pediatrics, complex pediatric surgery. So there are uh, infinite opportunities for uh, quite challenging uh, circumstance, but uh, really enjoyable medicine circumstance as well. Thanks. If you want to know a little bit more um, about that uh, trip and about that student, there is a story in the upcoming student magazine about that, which you can find on our website. So my last question for you, Professor Duan, is what should a prospective student consider or think over before they apply to OUM? Uh, well, I think OUM is uh, teaching students how to care for their patients into the future. And uh, they should think about uh, looking at the Hippocratic Oath, for instance, which we metaphorically take, which has you reaching beyond the patient in front of you to do good work for the community through your advocation in relationship to healthcare and in relationship to that patient. So uh, wanting AUM is wanting to teach people to reach beyond just the patient in front of them and to develop the sense that uh, if you've watched the movie Patch Adams, there's a wonderful perspective that comes out of that. It's a movie about a pediatrician who relies on the energies from his patients to develop the energy to improve patients beyond the ones that he's seeing in front of him as well. So gaining the energy to uh, want to do what the Chinese proverb says, and that's find a job you enjoy and you'll never have to work a day in your life. So I think that's um, expecting that you're going to enjoy your career by coming into OUM and working through that sense of a philosophy of caring, of giving, but energizing through that giving. Fantastic. So some, some work to do in the background, read the Hippocratic Oath and watch Patch Adams. <laughs> is there is there anything else, any other information or wisdom you'd like to impart that we haven't touched upon today that you'd like to give to our prospective students at our webinar today? Um, yeah, one, one thing is that uh, as you move through the preclinical and then you're moving into the clinical, one of the things to do is it's a little bit like learning a new language. So that if you're coming into a clinical rotation, uh, if you've got a little bit of exposure to the language that's going to be spoken in internal medicine, then go and do some background reading that allows you to uh, hear a few more of the words, so to speak, get you in the repetition. Uh, if you're doing a surgical rotation, uh, if you're going to an operating list, go and read up on the operation before you're there. So again, you can understand the language that is being used a little more because you've read it once and you're hearing it again so that gradually you learn the skills but you also learn the language of interchange so that you can have the conversation around the clinical material. Lifelong learning is so important. Um, I want to thank you so much for joining us as our special guest. Um, for those of you attending either live today or via recording, if you'd like to hear more about some of the things that Professor Dewan works on, in addition to his role as Dean, he's the clinical coordinator for New South Wales, we have a session in March with Professor Dewan as well as our clinical coordinators. Um, to other clinical coordinators in Australia. So I invite all of you to that session as well. So thank you so much, Professor Patty, for, for coming today and sharing those words of wisdom with us. Great. Thank you. And good luck to everyone. All right. So I want to speak with you um, a little bit about the OUM curriculum and a little bit about the supports that OUM provides throughout this curriculum. Because I think if you just think about, well, what are the courses that I'm going to have to take what are the tests that I'm going to have to do? What are the textbooks that I'm going to have to read? It may seem a little bit overwhelming, but one of the things that's really unique about OUM is our student support programs that we're not just here to fill your mind with information. We're here to support you to gain the knowledge, skills, attitudes, and beliefs to make you a safe and effective clinician. So we're not just hear about you know, providing course and curriculum, but also supporting you to get as much as possible out of that curriculum. 
So the way that OUM curriculum is structured is we have a preclinical phase, a transitional phase to prepare you for the clinical phase, and then a clinical phase. So during the preclinical phase, you'll first have a one week uh, virtual orientation, we call it OE, so you get to meet all of the people in your cohorts and virtually um, all of the administrative and leadership staff at OEM will come and speak with you and connect with you. And then you start a general principles course, which really provides you with a foundation to be able to explore, to learn, to increase your critical thinking, um, to be able to um, analyze uh, material and digest material in a way that helps you apply it moving forward. So the first part of the preclinical phase is really going through that general principles course, which you do with your entire cohort. Um, after general principles are the set of the preclinical medical sciences, and those units um, will nest the medical sciences that you would be used to hearing about medical teaching, anatomy and physiology and pharmacology and immunology and micro, microbiology and microanatomy and cell biology. All of those are nested um, into courses that really give you a deep study at the system level. So you'll have preclinical medical sciences that are focused on the cardiovascular system. So you learn all of the pre-medical sciences within the system of cardiovascular. And you'll have urinary, endocrine, reproductive. Can't wait to see you in both of those courses. Those are the courses I'm course director for. Um, I've been teaching endocrine and reproductive at OUM for 10 years. And I'm really, um, this, this new uh, curriculum, the set that we have um, developed now are, is really kind of state of the art. Um, and in addition to nesting those medical sciences within the organ systems, we also incorporate medical case-based learning and discussions. So there's a mix in the preclinical phase of having these recorded on-demand learning objective-based virtual materials and resources along with live virtual sessions. So there's a workshop, there's a case discussion, and there's a lecture chat so that, that you get to go and have that live interaction with your classmates and with your professors every week. Um, and that's throughout those whole, um, all of those organ systems. Um, in addition to that, we also have Journal Club, which allows students to be able to um, understand the um, published literature, being able to dive into topics that are of interest to them, to present that to others, give you some of those presentation skills. We also have Research Club because research is a requirement of the MD degree at OUM. So Research Club also gives you kind of a non-confrontational way to explore the research literature, explore research methods and how to apply them within a unique research project of your design. Uh, throughout the preclinical phase and after you finish um, general principles, you're not only exposed to curriculum, but you're also exposed to OUM support systems. So all students um, will have an academic advisor. So that's a one-to-one -one faculty member that you're able to meet with each week. Sometimes you'll go over quizzes or material you don't understand. Sometimes you'll say, I'm just feeling really underwater this week. Help me with my study skills, or I just need someone to talk to about kind of getting through whatever's happening this week. That academic advisor is there for you. You'll also have a clinical mentor. So this is an individual um, who is a practicing physician in their field, usually someone who lives uh, near you that you are able to shadow, observe, and learn from. So it's a really unique opportunity to get some exposure to the clinical world while you're still in your preclinical phase of the curriculum. The preclinical phase ends with a preclinical exam. I know that's everyone's favorite, but it's really designed just to be an overview of all the materials um, that you've gone through, assessed, digested, and learned um, in your deep study of the organ systems. Um, after that is the transition phase. So this phase is really to support your development um, in being able to transition into the clinical phase. Because during the preclinical phase, you're really focused on uh, the learning of the medical sciences and how to apply them. But we're going to help you take that jump to how you actually apply them, uh, critically analyze information, um, apply what you've learned in you know, your virtual um, learning materials, apply what you've discussed in class, actual patient scenarios that you would see during the clinical phase. So in the transition phase, you'll have clinical transition units that include things like public health or ethics, 
Um, for those of you who are um, in North America or who are planning on practicing in the United States, um, the clinical transition phase includes um, a USMLE Step 1 prep course and NBME exams, which help prepare you for passing the USMLE Step 1, which is required um, for licensure in the United States. Um, and then at the end of that, um, there's a clinical skills course, which includes on-demand, um, recorded resources, live virtual sessions, and even in-person clinical skills teaching. At the end of the transition phase, you'll also have completed your research project proposal. So um, we're not just expecting that you know how to do a research project and know how to do research project proposal, you'll also be matched with a research advisor, which can help you take some of the information that you've gained from your exposure to research club and journal club to help identify a topic of your interest and to start to formulate a research question and research methodology around that to propose that project. And then you also are able to get feedback from the research director and other students when you propose your project. So after all of that is the phase that most students are looking forward to the most um, when they're at your stage, that is the prospective student phase at OUM, which is the clinical phase. So the clinical phase chiefly consists, um, firstly, of core rotations. So, you know, you're really interested in doing community and family medicine core rotation and internal medicine surgery and so on. That all happens as part of your core rotations. For those of you who are um, in North America, who are planning on practicing at some point, um, maybe not now, maybe sometime in the future in the United States, that's the time point where you'll be receiving the USMLE Step 2 prep course and NBME prep exam, NBME exam for preparation in taking the USMLE Step 2, which is another licensure requirement for those who are planning to practice in the United States. After that, you do your elective rotation. So that's where you really get to shine in areas that may be important to you. So maybe you are interested in dermatology or endocrinology. Those are the times where you'll get to kind of dive into um, those areas and get some additional training. That elective rotation phase also includes the Samoa rotation, which is an amazing opportunity for OUM students to spend four weeks at the Tupua Tomasese Mayole Hospital um, in Apia, Samoa, which is will really give you um, an amazing experience in your clinical rotations. I'm going to let Leela talk with you a little bit about that as well, if she'd like to. Um, after that, after your elective rotations are complete, you'll focus on completing your research project and your graduation exams, including the OSCE and Objective Structured Clinical Exam that's designed to help you, help support you as you um, uh, move towards your licensure requirements in Australia, in Canada, in the US, in New Zealand, and in Samoa. In addition, um, the clinical phase, it may seem like, oh, well, now you're just kind of out on your own or just with the people in your clinical rotations that you're not part of the cohort that you've built during your preclinical phase. But there's also grand round sessions that continue on throughout the clinical phase that allow for you to continue that uh, interaction um, in a learning based context with your um, peers. And there are also, um, there's also a program called Stethoscopes Down, which is the clinical student meetup that happens each month as well. So that's the OUM curriculum um, in a nutshell. It takes between four and four and a half years, depending on um, whether you're planning to complete the licensure requirements um, for, or, sorry, to complete the licensure requirements for practice um, in the US. Um, a couple of questions from the chat window. So Bala wanted to know, is this, will this recording be made available for later reviewing? That would be much appreciated. So absolutely, if you'd like to view this recording later on, please get in touch with your admissions counselor. Uh, Maria wants to know, does the uni have accommodations for international students for when you need to head over for our placement? So um, uh, Mario, OUM accepts students in Australia, New Zealand, uh, Samoa, Canada, and the United States. So you need to be a resident in one of those areas um, to allow for you to be able to go through the OEM curriculum and to be able to practice in those areas. 
If you are an international student who is a resident within um, those countries, there aren't additional hoops that you need to, to um, gloss over unless, for example, you have transcripts that are in a foreign language, those have to be translated for um, admissions purposes. So if you have some, um, uh, if you have more questions that are more specific to your case, Mario, I would advise you to get in touch with your admissions counselor and they can be a little bit more specific um, about that. But I'm gonna um, ask Angelo um, if he has anything to add to Mario's question about accommodations for international students. Um, yeah, you know, as you mentioned, uh, Dr. McGuire, that, you know, currently just given, uh, you know, the fact that we have clinical rotations available in certain countries, uh, you have to be a resident of, either Australia, New Zealand, Canada, US, or Samoa in order for us to accept uh, your application uh, as a prospective student. Uh, I think Maria may have been mentioning placements. So I, I don't know if Maria, you're referring to placement as far as accommodations when you go out to your uh, clinical rotations, but I would imagine uh, those are up to the student. Uh, to uh, find their local accommodations uh, for the clinical rotations, if that's uh, possibly what you were, you were referring to. I will just add that um, you may have set, um, thought of this yourself when we were talking about the Samoa um, elective rotation. And there are supports from OUM for students who are going to Samoa. Um, we have uh, staff within um, the Tupua Tumasese Maoli Hospital and our OUM campus is there. So as students are preparing for their Samoa rotation, they're able to receive supports um, and things like, you know, visas and accommodation and all of that can be discussed with that um, team to help support you to um, have all of your energy and time devoted to your clinical rotation while you're in Samoa. Yeah, and I think Mario just sent another message saying he he was asking about there we go. the Samoa Perfect. <laughs> okay. Rotation. So thanks, Mario, for clarifying. All right. So if you have further questions um, about OUM's curriculum, um, I'm happy to answer those if you type them in the chat window. But I'd like for us to um, hear from Wheela Life Lima, who is our OUM student ambassador in Samoa. So Wheela, would you um, introduce yourself to our prospective students, please? Hello everyone, my name is Wila and um, I just completed my OSCE exam that was done in uh, Brisbane, Australia last November and um, I'm finishing up my uh, final manuscript and then I am getting ready for uh, uh, to graduate in May, hopefully in uh, Brisbane. Thank you very much. So Wheela, I know this was a long time ago for you, but is there anything that you'd wish that you'd known or done before you applied to OUM? Um, thank you, Prof. McQuire, for that. So um, I think to answer this question, um, I knew before joining uh, med school, I knew that med school was going to be very hard and I knew I had to work uh, extra harder and I also knew that there will be a lot of readings and required me many hours to read um, in order for me to uh, understand concepts about any topics. And I knew that there will be a lot of weekly quizzes. But all of these, I knew that there were and still are people from the faculties and also my um, academic advisors that have helped me and my journey. Um, and I knew that I had to ask in order to get the right answer. And from joining the med school, um, you have to have a well-planned uh, schedule, which is very essential. And you might not uh, study the same uh, way as your peers do or during your previous um, qualification. And uh, do not underestimate the importance of the community and mentorship. Um, as Prof. McQuiet was uh, um, telling us about the phases of the uh, preclinical and the transition phase and the clinical phases, 
So there are a lot of the checklists that we need to check out. By saying this, uh, we had to complete the in introduction to uh, medicines, the e-foundations, the system-based modules, and the uh, final exams as well. So there will be clinical exams, and there will be mini cases as well, but all of these will make sure that you are prepared for the, for the job. And I know that there were uh, faculties and people that helped me. And if you are here and you want any question, uh, you want any answers to your questions, please uh, know that the student admin uh, administration's offices are here to assist in answering your questions. And so as the ambassadors, and I am very happy to answer any questions in regards with uh, Samoa's rotation and also our student offices. And of course, our beloved Prof. Uh, McGuire. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks, Wheela. I really appreciate that. So if you have questions for Wheela, you can go ahead and type them into the Q&A box. So we do have a bit of time for our Q&A period. If you have any questions about OUM's curriculum or the admissions process or about Wheela or the Samoa rotation, we're happy to um, answer those during this time. And Mila, I'll just ask you, what was it like? Like, what are the rotations like at TTM Hospital? Did you, did you enjoy it? Were you exposed to a lot of learning? What was that like for you? Um, thank you, Prof. McQuire. So all of my uh, clinical core rotations and electives were all done in Samoa, um, starting from internal medicine, surgical, um, psych, uh, pediatrics, and so on. So I have learned that um, it was very um, hard and challenging to have um, clinical practice, where as Prof. Uh, D1 was mentioning, all that you do uh, are based on what you, um, you do with your hands and your brain. So we don't have these fancy um, machines that um, Australia, America, and Canada have, but <clears throat> Um, taking history and proper history taking of the patient is very um, important because this is where um, probably the 80 percent of the diagnosis of the patient comes from and this is where you have to work on with the lit little resources that we have here in Samoa so it was very challenging but also rewarding at the same time thank you thanks Thanks for being so generous with your time today, Wheela. Um, if uh, students, prospective students that are here today, if you are interested in having a chat or emailing with a student ambassador, um, we have uh, six student ambassadors um, who can tell you a little bit more about the, our program or their experiences. Just get in touch with your admissions counselor and they're, they're happy to connect you with one of our student ambassadors. So in terms of next steps, I'm going to turn this over to Angela to talk a little bit about application deadlines. Great. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, you're, there's still time to get everything in for the July intake. We have an application deadline set for March 1st. So you have uh, still a few weeks left. If you're uh, working on your application, great. Um, if you ever need an update as to you know what's missing uh, and what's not you can always log into your online application uh, most of the information should be uh, up there for you but again you can always uh, contact us and just in case you're not sure if something has been received uh, or not um, usually the, the items that take a little bit longer to get here uh, not necessarily because of the the physical aspect of it but the recommendation letters um you once you provide us with a reference we email them so make sure to tell your uh, you know references that uh the email was coming out to them get that signed and submitted and uh, and uploaded um to the link that we are providing them so again uh and if you're a, a prospective student and uh, as i mentioned if you're making that decision that uh, this is where you want to be great uh we look forward to working with your application there's still plenty of time uh, to get that application in. Uh, and 
uh, you know, if you're if all goes well uh, and the interviews go well and you're accepted to the program, our orientation week uh, will happen um, before right before classes begin. So from the 11th uh, to the 14th, if you're on the North American side, from the 12th to the 15th, if you're out in Australia and New Zealand, and that'll just kind of give you a chance to uh, meet your fellow incoming students uh, and, and get yourself ready uh, to become a medical student. So. Um, Again, uh, plenty of time left and, you know, uh, look forward to working uh, with many of you here that are here. Thanks, Angelo. I look forward to seeing many of you in a week um, as well, um, which will be running uh, in July, the 11th to 14th or 12th to 15th, depending on the hemisphere that you are in. And the general principles course then starts on the 18th of July. Angelo, we have a question from Greg who's in North America and wants to know when is North American admissions team available to call or chat with? If you're in North America, uh, best time to call would be usually between uh, 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. if you're on Eastern time. So you can uh, uh, just kind of, uh, you know, work that to your uh, local time zone. Uh, if we're not available, please leave a message. Um, I promise you someone will get back to you, but usually from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. is the best time uh, to reach us. If you want to schedule a time for us to speak, you're always welcome to uh, just email admissions and we can connect via email and, and set a designated time uh, for the call. And and you more than likely, you're going to speak to me if you're calling the uh, North American admissions line. Thanks, Angelo. Good day to you too, Ngozi. Uh, you want to know how long are breaks between courses? So there are two week breaks in between the um, general principles and organ system courses. The breaks between clinical rotations, you cannot guarantee that there will be a specific amount, two weeks of break um, in between, but in terms of the preclinical portion, there's two week breaks. Um, the university also has a holiday period um, over the December or January holidays for about four weeks. Um, and Gozi also wants to know what does clinical rotation look like for married students? I guess the answer to that would be as diverse as the number of married students that we have at OUM. So one of the things that you'll see at OUM is that we have a really wide variety of backgrounds and experiences in our students. So we have a lot of students who are uh, married, who may have children, who may have grown children, who may be um, divorced, who may be single, who may be young, who may be old. So clinical rotations look for married students this, the same way they kind of look for all students, that um, you devote that time to the site that um, you are required for that time period. You additionally have some clinical coursework um, to do, readings to to look after. So clinical rotations are really about how much you can put in, what you'll get out of it. Um, and one of the things that um, we know kind of as a success measure for all our students is having a support system in place. And I can't believe I waited till the end of the session to say this, but support systems are incredibly important. So if you are a married student, I would say that support from your spouse or from your significant other or from others in your support system is incredibly important for your success in medical school. So having opus, open and honest communication with them about your responsibilities in terms of um, where you need to be at certain times and the, the level of study that you need to do is very important. So. Um, if you want to know more about that, maybe you'd like to speak with one of our married students and you can have ask the admissions counselor to put you in touch with one of our student ambassadors. Um, Nishika wants to know, or Neshka, sorry, I'm not wearing my glasses. I think it's Neshka. Sorry for mispronouncing your name. I was wondering if international transcripts are accepted or would it have to be from one of the countries OUM accepts for admission? So I'm going to pass it over to Angelo. Great. Uh, and, and actually, before I answer that, I want to, I want to jump back to Ngozi's uh, question. That's a great one thing I will say that's different, uh, at least if you're a married uh, student, you know, if you're single and if you have to do a rotation outside of your home city, you can pick up and go for the most part. So that is, uh, I wouldn't say it's necessarily an advantage, but that's something to keep in mind. If you are, uh, you know, have a significant other, you are married, um, you know, from I would hope that you would have those conversations about what's going to happen when I reach clinical years and I what if I have to go away from home. 
uh, and who's going to go? Are we all going to go together? Is one person going to stay behind? So I think that I would uh, have those conversations with uh, that uh, significant other uh, for um, the, the planning process. As far as uh, Nishka's question, this is a really great question, actually. So international transcripts, if this is uh, where you received your bachelor's degree and it's not in one of the countries that we mentioned that we primarily serve, you do need to get that evaluated. Um, now that process is a little bit different if you're in North America or in Australia. So I would encourage you to contact the admissions team to give you more information. Uh, in North America, we usually do that to one of the agencies that provide evaluation services like uh, WES and um, there's, there's, there are a few other ones. In Australia, it's, I believe it's done through um, a government organization. Uh, so keep that in mind. But yes, to, to answer your question, if you have an international uh, transcript, again, international meaning coming from the five countries, outside of the country, five countries that we serve, you do need to uh, get that evaluated just so that we can see what we're looking at. You know, we need to, you know, make sure you have uh, the, the degree and, and the uh, requirements uh, to be a student here, and we can have some sort of idea of what uh, grades and, and, and kind of uh, marks you received before, uh, kind of this and make a decision about your acceptance. Thanks, Angelo. Hello, Gold. Gold wants to know, I just want to ask if orientation would be online or in Samoa. Great question. So a week is online. It's a mix of um, on-demand resources and live sessions, um, which run, there's one session each morning if you are in um, Southern Hemisphere and one session each evening. If you are in the Northern Hemisphere, it's actually the same session just based on your time zone. You'll either be there in the morning or in the evening. Um, and Gold also wants to know how long do clinical rotations take per day? I'm actually going to defer that question to our next session happening in March, where we'll have our clinical coordinators here to answer all questions you have regarding clinical rotations in states in Australia. So we're gonna hold your question, Gold, and we're gonna answer it. We're gonna have our clinical coordinators answer, answer that in our March session. And then lastly, after study at OUM, what is the possibility of getting internship positions in Australia? So OUM is considered an international medical school, meaning students who want to practice in Australia um, must take the AMC exams one and two. So your possibility of getting internship positions um, at a specific time depends on your ability to pass those exams at a certain time. So we have many students who are practicing in Australia after they've completed those exams, and we have many students in process of taking those exams um, and uh, get, gaining their internship positions in Australia. So I'm not going to pass it over to you, to you, Angelo, since you're not the expert on all things um, Australia, but thanks so much, Gold, for those questions. So if you have any remaining questions, I encourage you to get in touch with your admissions counselor um, who have a wealth of information, um, specifically to get in touch with your admissions counselor for the region in which you are a resident, because there are some specific um, uh, uh, particulars depending on where you happen to be residing in the world. Although we are one university, one community, we have to be very um, welcoming of all of those different particulars and making sure that we have staff available to answer your questions and to meet your needs. So um, Angelo and I and the rest of the admissions um, team and the rest of the student ambassadors and the faculty and staff at OUM want to thank you so much for your attendance and participation in our admissions um, webinar today. Um, we look forward to you joining the OUM community in the future. Angelo, is there any closing comments you'd like to give? No, other than uh, thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, you know, again, as I mentioned, you have till March 1st. I shouldn't say tonight, today or tonight, depending on where you are. You have till March 1st to get the application completed. Uh, we look forward to helping you, uh, you know, go through that process and, and you know, hopefully get you ready uh, to become an uh, OUM student. So good luck, everyone. Thanks. Bye, everyone. Mm -hmm.